Good morning, I want to welcome everyone watching uh, online and around the world. This is our Palm Sunday celebration. If you have your Bible, I would ask that you would turn to the Gospel of Luke, chapter 19. I used to, when I first got saved, I used to listen on the radio to a guy by the name of uh, Dr. J. Vernon McGee. He's still on the radio with his Through the Bible study, and he used to call him Dr. Luke, the great physician, my beloved so if you'll turn to Luke chapter 19, and we're going to begin reading in verse 37. Again, Luke 19, verse 37. I'll wait for you to find your place there. Those of you at home, I hope you're looking up in your Bible as well, because if we're not preaching from the, bri from the Bible, we're wasting time. Because the power isn't in my preaching. The power is in the Word of God. It alone is, is anointed. Amen? All right. And we also have to remember, I, mean, I, I just want to share before we get to the word itself, I remember hearing uh, uh, an evangelist in our church, Stephen Manley, and he would say, and I've shared this with you before, but it just strikes me so powerfully, that when someone is reading to you the words of the New Testament, especially the red letters, it's as if the very lips of Jesus are parting to speak to you. So it's not me, it's him. So let's, let's listen, all right? And uh, as, as you're turning there, and I know some of you are still trying to find it, uh, as a child, I had many memories of going to watch professional sporting events when I was a kid with my family. My dad would take us to those. Probably the ones I, I remember the most would be going to see the uh, Detroit Tigers play. I love baseball. I still do. I watched the Tigers lose yesterday. But I remember as a kid, they would have special things. They'd have family day where you could bring your family and it was only like $4 a ticket. You can't do that anymore. I remember bat day, which wasn't always a great idea. Imagine giving, you know, 50,000 people in Detroit a club. It just didn't work out that well sometimes. But they had bat day and all different kinds of things. And I loved going to Tiger Stadium. And once or twice, I'd been to a basketball game to see the Detroit Pistons play at the Palace of Auburn Hills, which is, I think, now torn down. I'd even gone to watch the Detroit Lions lose a couple of football games. And I remember watching the, uh, the Detroit Red Wings play one time. It might have been twice. But the first time, and that was our hockey team, the Red Wings. And I remember the first time I went, I was very young. Very young, just a little guy. In fact, I was too young to really appreciate what was going on. What I do remember, and it's, rem it's funny how you remember things when you were a kid, but not everything, but I do remember we sat way up high in the arena, and when something exciting took place on the ice, the crowd would stand, thus leaving me unable to see what was going on, and I was wondering what was taking place. I don't know who won or lost the game, but for those who wanted to see their team win, it was a victory. For those who wanted to see their team win and they didn't, it was a tragedy. I, on the other hand, I didn't know who won or lost because I didn't know what was going on. So, let's look to the Word, shall we? Today is Palm Sunday and we remember this is the day of Jesus' triumphal entry, a week before his crucifixion. And just like a sporting event, there were three different groups of people that were there long ago that day. There were those who saw triumph. There were those who saw tragedy. And there were those who simply missed what was happening. They saw no real significance in the events of the day. So let's pick up our story in Luke chapter 19, verse 37. You can follow along in your Bible or on the screen. When he came near to the place where the road goes down to the Mount of Olives, the whole crowd of the disciples began to joyfully to praise God in loud voices for all the miracles they had seen. I'm in, I'm in verse 38 now. Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. Some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to Jesus, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. I tell you, he replied, if they keep quiet, the stones will cry out. As he approached Jerusalem and saw the city, 
He wept over it. Look at verse 42. He said, if you, even you, had only known on this day what would bring you peace, but now it is hidden from your eyes. The days will come when your enemies will build an embankment against you and encircle you and hem you in on every side. They will dash you to the ground, you and the children within your walls. They will not leave one stone on another because you did not recognize the time of God's coming to you. In your notes, I mentioned three groups. First is the triumph, and that was those who received. Verses 37 and 38, keep your Bibles open because we're going to go there quite a bit. 37 and 38 says, when he came near the place where the road goes down to the Mount of Olives, by the way, I've been on that road, and it's just as beautiful as can be. The whole crowd of disciples began to joyfully to praise God in loud voices for all the miracles they had seen. They had seen it. They had witnessed it. And with that, they responded in verse 38, Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. A week before the cross, Jesus entered Jerusalem to cries of praise and worship. This was a triumphal entry. It was at that time that Jesus was, I guess you could say, the most popular or, the, or at the height of his public ministry. A lot of things he did in private, but not anymore. Here he's saying, here I am, this is me, this is what's going on. Don't believe me? Look at the people just cheering because of the miracles they've seen. He was recognized not just as a miracle guy, he was recognized as the Messiah. Big difference. In Matthew, it says, Hosanna to the son of David. In Mark, it says, Hosanna, blessed is the kingdom, the coming kingdom of our father, David. In John, says, blessed is the king of Israel. The word Hosanna means save us now. That's what it means. Save us now. It was an expression of praise. The crowds recognized who Jesus was and for all the miracles that they had seen. Now, a, a week later, a similar scene took place at the cross. And one of the thieves, if you don't know the story, I hope you can get into the Gospels and, and read about the, the, the triumphal entry and the death and the amazing resurrection of our Lord. Make that the, your, your week's reading if you really want this to be a holy week to grasp what it is. Because what it was is Jesus was nailed as prophesied between two thieves. There were two other criminals being crucified. And one of them, he recognized his own crime, and he knew he was getting exactly what he deserved. He had broken the law and was being punished for it. His Hosanna, which is crying out, save me, and praising, and you're the Messiah, was a simple declaration of faith and trust. Quote, remember me when you come to your kingdom, end quote. Remember me when you come, come into your kingdom. Who comes into his own kingdom? A king. That's what Jesus recognizes. Huh? And Jesus responded to his request with an affirmation and promise of salvation. Today you will be with me in paradise. No theological argument, no strings attached, just the gift of eternal life. I want to say, boom, baby, right there. It happened. You can write that down. Boom, baby. A boy and his father were driving down the country road one time on a beautiful spring afternoon when a bumblebee flew into the car window, right inside the car. The little boy, who was allergic to bee stings, he was petrified, and the father quickly reached out in midair and grabbed the bee, and he squeezed it. And then he released it. And the boy grew frantic as it buzzed by him again. But once again, now the father reached out his hand. And this time he pointed to his palm. There, stuck in his skin, was the stinger of the bee. Okay. He said, do you see that? Do you see this? Said, you don't have to be afraid anymore. I've taken the sting for you. You don't need to fear death anymore. Do you know that? Death is not pretty. It's not. 
If you've ever seen someone die, it's kind of gross. It is. But you don't have to fear it. And if you're a believer, it's not that gross because you know that the second they take their last breath here in this earth, they're taking their first breath in heaven. Because the word says if you're absent from the body, you're present with the Lord. Amen? Amen? That's a cool thing. See, Christ died and he's risen again. I think I might talk about that a little bit at our sunrise service next week. He has taken that sting from death. We no longer need to fear the grave. Like the disciples, that thief who accepted, I hope Hosanna is on your lips today. Truly. Just Jesus, save me. You've recognized that you have a need and you've asked Christ to save you. Thank him for what he has done to give him the honor do his name. Like those early followers, we worship our king and we lay down what we have before him as he moves through our lives. That was your first group, the triumph. The second group is tragedy, those who rejected. Back to the word, please. Verse 39. Some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to Jesus, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. Rebuke is a Bible word. We don't say it much anymore. How would you put it? It, it would be a telling off. It would be a scolding. It would be a, a, a powerful correction. It would be. I tell you, he replied. He, oh, he said, tell your disciples to knock it off. Look it up. That's what it says. He says, if they will keep quiet, the stones will cry out. What in the world does that mean? I have wrestled with that in Ross. At the triumphal entry, the Pharisees had clearly understood what the crowds were saying. They knew it. And you know what rocked their world? It threatened their lives. They knew that the crowds were naming Jesus their Messiah. And they knew that this was a terrible blasphemy against God. And Jesus' response to their complaint that he was more than just a prophet, that he was God incarnate. How do I know this? Maybe this will be the time you understand what it means that the rocks will cry out. The only reason a rock would praise him is if he were the maker of that rock. I made it, and I can make it cry out in praise to me. The Pharisees had made up their mind that Jesus could not have been who he claimed to be, so they wanted to kill him. And that's what they did. A week later, one of the thieves, I already mentioned one, the one who accepted him, but there was another one on the other side of him, and that one denied him as well, as well as the Pharisees, part of that tragic story. He had made up in his mind that Jesus was not who he claimed to be. He wrote him off as just another crazy man dying for some purpose. I don't know, for some crime. He rejected his claim to deity and rejected his claim that he was the Messiah or the Savior. Though Jesus, check this out, Jesus was so close and the gift of eternal life was offered. This thief, though, he rejected it. During the, uh, the presidency of Andrew Jackson, a man by the name of George Wilson a postal clerk, he robbed a federal payroll from a train, and in the process, he killed a guard. The court convicted him and sentenced him to hang. But because of public sentiment against capital punishment, however, a movement began to secure him a presidential pardon for Wilson. After all, it was his first offense. And eventually, Jackson intervened with a pardon. Amazingly, and I don't want you to miss the point of this story. This isn't just a silly pastor's story. Amazingly, Wilson refused the pardon. And since this had never happened before, the Supreme Court was asked to make a rule whether someone indeed could refuse a presidential pardon. Well, Chief Justice John Marshall, Marshall that is, handed down the decision. And he said, quote, a pardon is a parchment whose value must be determined by the receiver of the pardon. Did you get that? It has no value apart from that which the receiver gives to it. Did you lose what I said? What, what, what the court says is 
let's say I'm the bad guy and you're the, you're the court and you want to pardon me and I say no, well, your pardon is worthless then. It doesn't mean a thing to me. George Wilson had refused to accept the pardon. We cannot conceive why he would do so, the judgment continued on, but he has. Therefore, George Wilson must die. George Wilson, as punishment for his crime, was hanged. Pardon declared by the Supreme Court must not only be granted, but it must be, ready? It must be accepted. Huh? It must be, we live in a world that does not recognize Jesus. Huh? It, well, they do, but they don't recognize him for who he is. Though a pardon has been granted, they refuse to accept it. They have rejected the idea of Jesus as Lord and Savior. They pass Jesus off as a prophet or a good moral teacher, ignoring his words and his works. They, they see our praise, yours and mine, as blasphemy of the worst possible kind. Either that or they just think you're foolish, simple-minded people. And they would quiet us. But even if we should stop, all of creation would still worship. Amen? Are you with me? The kingdom of God is forcefully advancing and nothing will, nothing will stop it from moving forward. God's plan for the nations will, will become reality. Number three. And this was me at the hockey game as a little squirt. There were those who missed it, who missed what was happening, verses 41 to 44. Let's look at the word. As he approached Jerusalem and saw the city, he wept over it. He said, if you even you had only known on this day what would bring you peace. But now it is hidden from your eyes. The day will come upon you when your enemies will build an embankment against you and encircle you and hem you in on every side. They will dash you to the ground, you and the children within your walls. They will not leave one stone on another because you did not recognize the time of God's coming to you. Wow, do not miss what this is about. Perhaps the largest group during that time wasn't the people praising in triumph and wasn't the angry ones in tragedy. It might have been the bystanders. It could have been the bystanders that day. I mean, they saw what was happening, but they didn't understand what it meant. They were busy going on with their lives. With Passover approaching, the road to Jerusalem would have been a very busy, busy place. Certainly, there must have been many there that day that wondered what was happening. Perhaps they had heard all the things that Jesus had done. They were spectators, and they were undecided in what to make of him. So when Jesus looks up at Jerusalem and he approaches, he knows what will happen. He sees the day, it's, it's 70 A.D. that I'm talking about. He sees 70 A.D. when it will be burned and it will be destroyed. And there won't be one stone left upon another. He sees the, the destruction. He sees that the enemy will triumph over it. It would be destroyed because it did not recognize the time of God's coming. Now, a week later... There were also bystanders at the foot of the cross. Okay? Yes, there were many soldiers that mocked and cursed Jesus, but I'm sure that there were others who were just there that day because it was their job. Hmm? They were told, crucify the outlaw, and that's what they were doing. But they were not there to bless or to curse. They were simply there because they were supposed to be. That was what was expected of them. And do you know what they were doing for his clothing? They were playing games at the foot of the cross. Right there they were. These men were so close. They sat at the foot of the cross, inches away from the Savior of the world, and seeing a chance to make some money, they took the clothes of Jesus and they rolled the dice for them. They were so close and yet they were so far away. They neither accepted nor rejected. Did you get that? They were just simply there, killing time and playing games. Yeah. 
You're understanding where I'm going with this, don't you? There are people like that who may be here today. I'm serious. You're here, but you're kind of, you're kind of on, the, on the sidelines. You claim to see, but yet you don't. You don't, and you know you don't. You've tried to fool everyone else, but you're not going to fool yourself, and you're certainly not going to fool God. I mean, let's be honest. You walk it kind of clean. You don't curse God, but you don't really praise him either. All right? You don't deny the claims of Jesus, but you also don't really fully embrace them or accept them. I understand. You're not out there shouting and mocking insults to him, but you also don't recognize him as Lord and Savior because you will not fall at his feet and just call him Lord. You know what you are? You're simply here. And I've been a pastor for 30 years and spent many years in the church before that. I know a lot of people, way too many, in the church who are simply here. Save us. Save us now. I don't want to be simply here. Do you? Huh? I mean, week after week, you do your duty, right? You come because... You're expected to come. You have some role to play. You sing out there because you're expected to sing. And you know what you are? You're so close to the cross, but you're playing games. You're playing games. That's dangerous, isn't it? Am I wrong? Is that dangerous? So Easter is a time of decision. Two thieves, one on either side of Jesus. One believes and one rejects. One is saved and another is lost. It's that simple, guys. It really is. I know preachers make it difficult to understand, but it's that simple. Either you is or you ain't. Well, there comes the cards and letters now. Either you are or you're not. All right? It's the very picture, when you think of Jesus in between two thieves, it's the very picture of decision. Right? For each one of us here, this day, right now, is a day of decision. You must decide today. Don't force me, Pastor. Okay, I'm not going to force you because I can't. But I also can't stop the truck from plowing you down when you get out of here. I also can't stop that itty-bitty little membrane in your heart, I mean in your head, from seizing and you're dead before you hit the ground in a stroke. I also can't stop your heart from having that heart attack. I also can't stop you falling down the stairs. I can't stop those things. And I can't stop you to the point where I can make you be a Christian. The only one who can decide to do that is the person sitting in your chair. But today is a day of decision between triumph and tragedy. Either accept Jesus or reject him. But you can't, and I am going to tell you this because it's, it's, it's so stupid to do it. And I've done it. I'm, I'm talking to you from experience. It's so stupid to do it. You can't keep sitting at the foot of the cross and play games. You can't do it. Either call him the lunatic the liar or Lord, but you must decide. You must. So when Jesus looked up at Jerusalem, it says that he wept. He said, I love you. Even you had only known on this day what would bring you peace. And there will come a time when it's hidden from your eyes. The days will come when your enemies will build an encampment around you, embankment against you, and they will dash it to the ground and they will not leave one stone on top of another because you did not recognize the time of God's coming to you. God is coming to you in this moment. See, Jesus saw the future of the city. He knew what would happen. And he wept because he knew the city he loved would reject him and be destroyed. There's something to think about. It's not a lot. As I ask uh, Pastor Eric and Aaron to come on up here and join me, it's not a lot to think about. 
It really isn't. I'm not asking you to join a church. I'm not asking you to give money. I'm asking you, what is the condition of your heart? Is it saved or is it stinking? You can write that one down. Is it saved or is it stinking? When Jesus looks at you today like he looked at Jerusalem, what does he see? Does he rejoice over you? Or does he weep over you? Does he weep at the thought that he was so close to you and you still got, did not recognize the coming of God to you? So Jesus is passing by each of us today. And you know what? The decision can be made anytime. That's true, and that's something the devil likes to let you know that, oh, go ahead and put it off. But the fact is, they say, now is the day of salvation. I know that's not a popular word in today's churches, but salvation means getting saved, getting right, getting square with God. So you must decide what to do. So how many times, <laughs> how many times have you seen them pass by you? Huh? Can I tell you, don't let him pass by again. Call out to him today. I'll give you an example. Years ago at Niagara Falls, there were two men in a boat, and they found themselves caught up by the current. I've been there, man, and that's a tough current as you get closer to the falls. The men jumped from their boat, and they swam. They tried to swim for shore. At the very last minute, ropes from the shore were thrown out to them. One of them grabbed the rope and was pulled ashore. The other man grabbed the rope as well. But at the same instant, it came into his hand. A log floated by him. Thoughtless and confused, the man, instead of seizing the rope, he laid hold on the log, and, well, that was a fatal mistake. I mean, they were both in imminent peril. But one was drawn to shore because he had a connection to the land. The other clinging to the loose floating log that was carried over the falls, and he was killed. A saving connection with God has been thrown out to you in Jesus Christ. He's on the shore, so to speak. He's holding the rope. And as we lay hold of him with one hand of faith, with just one hand of faith, he'll pull us to shore. However, folks, <laughs> there are logs that pass by. Huh? We must cling to one or the other. Today you must choose. Understand that this hour, within the hearing of my voice in this time, Jesus is passing by you. Can you reach out to him and be saved? Join the thief who cried out for salvation, and today you too can be seated with Christ in paradise. I'm going to ask you to stand as Pastor Eric and Aaron lead you in this song. Do you know next week is Easter and wouldn't it be a wonderful, wonderful Easter if you came to church on Easter a believer and follower in Christ. It makes all the difference not only in this world but in the next. Amen? Okay. Pastor, will you lead us? And come and pray. And give God your heart. Change my heart, oh God. Make it ever true. Change my heart, oh God. Don't let this kind of pass you off. Change my heart, oh God. Make it ever true. Change my heart, oh God. May I be like you. People are coming forward. You can too. You can. You the potter and I am the clay mold me and make me the 
This is what I pray. Pray it out. Pray it out. Change my heart, oh God. Make it ever true. Change my heart, oh God. May I be like Folks, you. I can't change your heart. I can't. You he are can. the potter. Yes, he can. You don't want to wait. You really don't. Are you going to make this decision on your way home? Change my heart. Now is the time to do business with God. May I be like you? As, as they're playing, I just I want to put that plea out there. I feel this is just way too important for you to miss. And you know who you are. Even if I don't, and no one else around you knows. And there's no room for judgment. And here these people that have come forward. It's not for judging them. In fact, I'm going to ask people to come and pray with them. Because that's who we are. We support one another, don't we? So the fact of the matter is, you know whether you're standing in victory, whether you're in tragedy and denial, or have you just been coming to church. Can I tell you, as Jesus looked to Jerusalem, his heart wept because it could have been different. And it could be different for you too. It could be different for you. I'm going to ask these guys to sing it one more time because maybe there's one more person. And this has nothing to do with me. It has everything to do with you. Everything. And if you want to come and you want to pray with those here, come now. Please do. And if you want to come and you want prayer for yourself, come now. Please do. Go ahead, Aaron. Change my heart, oh God. it ever true change my heart oh God may I be like you you are the potter be seated for just a moment. For those of you that are still here, let's, let's pray for those at the altar. This isn't a, a weird thing, folks. There's an old song that says, I'm so glad I'm a part of the family of God. And what it's about is just praying for one another. Let's pray. Father, I pray for those that have knelt, that have come, that are seeking you, Lord, I know your heart breaks for those that have been playing games at the cross and for those that have flat out, oh, they know your name, Lord, but so did the Pharisees. So does the devil. 
But without a saving faith in you, Lord, we are lost. Father, as we offer ourselves to you in gratitude for all you've done for us, Lord, we understand that it's not by our will, by our strength, but we've just come to recognize that we are sinners in need of saving. And the only way we can be saved is to accept the work that you've done on that cross and how next week we're going to celebrate that you rose again. You laid down your life for us. How can we do anything less than live a life for you? And we do that gladly, Lord. So we'd ask that you would save us from our sins. Forgive us for all that we've done wrong. And Lord, although our memories sometimes plague us with our past sins, your word says that once you've forgiven us, you remember them no more. You remember them no more. That makes us clean in your sight. We may not feel it, but it's the truth. And because of that, we're not just a better version of us. Your word says that we are a new creation. Help us to walk in the light that you've given us today. And when Easter comes next week, we're going to celebrate a risen Savior. And we thank you, Lord, for life everlasting, life more abundant, and a life only filled with praise for you. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless. We'll see you on Easter. Please invite, invite, bring a friend. It's going to be a, a wonderful celebration. And we'll see you at 8 o'clock. And then breakfast.